But wearables have come a long way from just tracking steps to tracking a whole bunch of variables. The frontier that we're at now is how to integrate them into the rest of the health system. These are all foundational principles that you need for a, a fulfilled, like wonderful life. And, and we have access to the tools to get there. Welcome back, or welcome to the Finding Mastery Podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Michael Gervais, by trade and training a high-performance psychologist. And I'm thrilled to welcome Dr. Kapil Parak to the podcast for this week's conversation. Kapil is a renowned cardiologist and the senior medical lead at Google, which means he's working on some pretty radical stuff. Kapil is more than a doctor. He's a leader in the wearable movement with keen insight into current trends and future directions. And when it comes to wearable health technology, I'm in. You've heard me love slob about Apollo Neuro, and if not, I want to encourage you to check them out, and I think you'll love what they're doing. So the question is, as we integrate more technology into our daily lives, and as the world of health technology progresses and evolves rapidly, what possibilities can they help us unlock? How can they numb us as an instrument? How can we leverage the power of wearables to go beyond mere physical tracking and genuinely enhance our psychological well-being as well? These questions form the springboard for our conversation with Kapil. He was raised in Zambia. He was educated at John Hopkins. And his diverse background infuses Silicon Valley innovations with the deep empathy of human-centered medicine. That combination is pretty cool. His trailblazing work is redefining healthcare and guiding us toward a healthier, more informed future. He's also the author of Searching for Health, the smart way to find health information online and put it to use. It's a practical guide for navigating the complexity of today's healthcare landscape. At his core, he is dedicated to empowering as many people as possible. He's helped launch products that have impacted over a billion lives, and it feels like he's just getting started. Whether you're a passionate tech enthusiast, a health professional, or more simply looking to level up your game, Kapil's insights promise to elevate your perception of what's possible with wearables, to empower you to make informed decisions that resonate with your body's own unique needs. So with that, Let's jump right in today's conversation with Dr. Kapil Parak. Kapil, I am so excited for this conversation. Thank you so much for carving out time in your very full schedule. And you wear so many different hats. Which, which one are you wearing today? That's a great question. Um, just me. So this is, this is my personal opinions. Um, what I say is like, you know, I work at Google. I see patients at the VA as a cardiologist. I have affiliations as a adjunct uh, professor at Yale and Georgetown. But today you're just getting me. These are my personal opinions. Uh, don't buy stock based on anything I say. Um, this is just uh, my personal opinion and, and nothing more. Okay, so you have this really unique background, this unique vantage point that allows you to see around some corners. And could we maybe get a glimpse of what's coming down the pipeline with health tech? Yeah, absolutely. So I think we're in this super exciting time. and. If you think about it, you know, when you look back to when the internet came or when smartphones came around, we, we knew it was big, but we just didn't know what it would look like. And when Google first launched or Amazon or pets.com, you didn't know which one was going to be successful and what it would look like. You just knew you were in an exciting time. And I think we're in that same sort of age right now with artificial intelligence. So it's a really exciting time. Okay. I love it. What are you excited about? So when you look at artificial intelligence, what it does, so I have a, a background in epidemiology, and when you think about like mathematical models, in the past what we could do is do like a regression model where you have some data points, you draw a line through it and say this is a general direction where things are going. And that gave us things like the Framingham equation, which tells you your risk of heart disease. You put in some numbers, it gives you a risk factor. The next thing that sort of came along was machine learning. So anybody who has a phone knows that it will find pictures that look like your kid or yourself or your spouse or whatever. And you never sat and labeled every photo. This is my kid. This is me. It just says, hey, these things all kind of look alike. And that's machine learning. It like understands these patterns in data, even though it's not um, uh, ones and zeros in the sense of numerical data. It's image 
and, and it still figures out those trends. Generative AI, which is sort of the latest version of AI, what that does is they've done these things they call foundational models where they map the entire internet, which like is just mind boggling to think about. They're like every relationship possible in the internet, like um, who's a present, who's the spouse, who's their kids, where do they live, like, and that expand that to everything. So you sort of have this like compute computational understanding of the world. And then the programming language is English. You just say, hey, so what does this mean uh, if you say, like, write me a poem or summarize for me uh, Shakespeare's works? And it can, it can do these incredible things with this. And I have an, my sense is this is going to have important implications for health, just as it will for many other things. So there's a lot of chatter about AI, and there's so many texts that are being built around it, solutions that are being built around it. Um, where do you see when it comes to health, like it's just a human health standpoint, do you see that there's going to be some, it's going to first interface with the wearables, or do you think that it's going to be more meta global awareness about how people are doing um, in general to be able to map up against them? So reference points. So again, is it a single point solution? Is it a reference point? It's, I know it's yes to both of those. And or is there something else that is, is getting you excited about um, the overall yeah. booming of, of wearables? It's yes and, out. honestly. Yeah, for sure. And it's just because there's so many applications of it. So I'll start for the, sort of from the wearables performance side of it and then head over to the health side of, of the house, as it were. Cool. Um, on the wearable side, I, I support Fitbit. I've been thinking about wearables for many years. I've worked on other stuff before that. Um, and one of the, so wearables are fascinating. So I started with 10,000 steps, great step counters. It was actually a fun fact is like the 10,000 steps number came from the Tokyo Olympics. It just has a great ring in Japanese. So it's a marketing term, I but it, like, it, 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 we should pause here for a minute. Sure. <laughs> right. We, Go for it. <laughs> yeah, we should pause here. Um, I, both of us are well aware of like where that came from and yes, but I, it, it's kind of like the 10,000 hour rule that doesn't really exist. <laughs> you know, Malcolm Gladwell went on. And yet it's a useful saying, construct. It's a useful construct. And so it's not a, a construct of precision necessarily. Exactly. So, so just open this up a little bit. And I think this will help sure. folks go, oh, so I don't need to get 10,000 in. You know, yeah, that's no, you not don't. The number. <laughs> yeah, so although but, would you say more is better or would you say less is better? So... It, it really, I'll do the doctor answer. It depends. Um, <laughs> oh, yeah. Okay, come on. So, all, right, good. Um, yeah, yeah. all right. So, so here's, here's what it depends upon. Um, if you look at the guidelines, and there's a 770 page document that summarizes the physical activity recommendations in the United States and a similar one across the world. So, if you ever have insomnia, that would be a starting point. Uh, kidding. Um, but it's, <laughs> It's a dense document that describes all the research that has gone into this space. And one of the, I can summarize that for you in six words. Move more, huff and puff sometimes. And those are the two main recommendations. Move more is where the step count comes in. So if you take, we're, I think you've said it, we're professional sitters. So if you get people moving, that is good for their health. And depending on which study you quote, some will say benefits start as early as going to like four or 5,000 steps, but they keep going. And the, so the most benefit you have with almost any intervention, if you've done any weightlifting, if you've done anything, you see the quickest gains when you go from like a pretty low level to the next level up. And then to, if you're an elite athlete to get that next, squeeze out that next extra percent, it takes an incredible amount of work. So the most health benefits you see are when you get the most energy people moving. Not to 10,000 steps, just to five or 6,000, whatever they were, a little bit more. If you're a high performer, shoot for 10, shoot for 12. Like that will get you more benefits. And, and at some point you reach injury levels. So like you don't want to be like 30,000 steps a day or something ridiculous like that. But 10,000 is actually a pretty reasonable number for the average relatively healthy person. And there's, there's good science behind that. Um, and, and even though it gets mocked a lot with the like, it came from the Olympics, it was a marketing campaign, it just is, is not grounded in science. Directionally it is. And so mm. take from that what you will in your own lives and just move more. That's good. I, I appreciate that. And I, I think it, it is important to know part of origin stories of where these quote, quote unquote sure. standards or rules come from. And 
they're less precise than we would like to admit sometimes. So yes. um, I love that. Okay, cool. And sitting as a new smoking, that's been around for a long time, you know, that yes. idea. And yep. so when you say huff and puff, you're not talking about vaping. No, thank you. We should be uh, not, clear, right? <laughs> no, we should be clear. Not about that. Not about sex. Like this is it could take many different kinds. Whoa! You just took <laughs> sex to huffing and what kind of sex are we having? Jeez. Somebody told me, I, I I've said this before, and somebody's like, I mean, like my husband would be very happy to hear that. I'm like, oh no no no, no. <laughs> not what oh, I meant. God. I'm like good. okay, okay. Um, all right. So, but but the the thing about these kinds of conversations, like you say something, I feel like we'll remember those six words because of that. Um, yeah, and, no, and so the, the huff and puff is um, it, it's condensed version of moderate to vigorous physical activity. So there's three levels of physical activity. There's light physical activity, which is like taking steps. And then there's moderate to vigorous physical activity. And so if you get your heart racing a bit and huff and puff, like you get out of breath, that's typically in the moderate to vigorous range. And it could be a moderate level, could even be a brisk walk, a gentle bike ride, something like that. Typically, vigorous is like a run, you know, something a little bit more than that. And what the guidelines recommend is 75 minutes, a minimum of 75 minutes a week of moder- uh, vig- vigorous physical activity, 150 minutes of moderate or some combination thereof. Okay, That's total, hard to even say. Total, <laughs> total, total, like wrap well, your no, head around. No, no, no. Let's do this again. Sorry to step on. This is really important. That's what, okay. are you rec- what are you recommending for a week? Um, yeah. Yeah. So do that one more time. So for a week. 75 minutes of vigorous. It's like three 25 minute workouts. Yep. Or 150 minutes of moderate. So like okay. if you do a, you know, 30 minute brisk walk five days a week, that will get you to the goal or some combination. For our folks that are super into it is that, are, is the 75 minutes, um, is that zone three, four, and five? So I'm not familiar with those zone numbers, the but the z- way we okay. calculate it, Okay. Please. Oh, go ahead. You, t- tell me about your zones and, and I'll tell you. Yeah, how zone to one to five. Like five is like, um, my heart is pounding through my chest. Like I'm, yeah. I, yeah. I, so, I want so my to guess stop is three, I, yeah. three or four would be moderate and then four or five would be bigger. So my guess is like 150 minutes of three or, you know, if you're getting to four and five, then 75 minutes. I think, I think it's probably two and three. We should, we should cross, like, do you we should cross check this? Yeah. Heart rate percentages that you're working from and I can help map which zones those would be in. And I, I want to give you a fun applied way to think about it too. But do you, are you working when you say um, 75 minutes of vigorous, do you have a percentage of heart rate that you're? Uh, yeah. You're so um, 50 to 75 uh, is, is the moderate and then above 75 is vigorous. Oh, you're right. Yeah. I think you're right. I think you nailed it then. Okay, perfect. Yeah. So four and five. So, so I would go two and, and, and three, two and three as the, as moderate and then yeah. um, four and five as vigorous. As vigorous. Okay. It's, it's typically that much. And, and, and this is where the 770 pages go in because then they're like, well, how do you define this? And is it like 220 minus age or is it like heart rate reserve? And you can really geek out on this stuff. And that's why I try and I shrink it down because I'm like, yes, we should. And it's important stuff. But, but the problem with that is like every fitness magazine is like, there's a new thing. You should work out at 11 a.m. every day. I'm like, no, the best time to work out is when you can because then you'll do it. Like, if you are convinced that that's the only time that is good for working out, then you're likely just not going to do it if that's not okay. convenient for you, right? So let's go. Uh, yes, and it depends. <laughs> no, we both used it. <laughs> okay, yes. like yeah, yes, and be, if if the only time you can work out, this is where it gets trick a little tricky. Is is let's call it eight p.m. Yep. And you want to fall asleep by ten thirty. Sure. Yeah, right? yeah, we, yeah. We, we're going right. to have problems in that. Like that, that effectively. That becomes problematic. I've learned as I've gotten older is that fitness, like after 6 p.m., I'm having a hard time. It's I wish it yeah. weren't so, Doc, but like if I'm if I drop my last weight or my last rep and I've done, you know, some intense work, I, I'm taking too long not to recover. Like I can get my heart rate down in a functional way just fine, which is a nice yeah. indicator of health or fitness, I should say. But like my whole system doesn't. No, you've got adrenaline down. surging through, and you're you're too wired for that. Okay, so this is a good. Okay, before I get I, I, I nerd out too much further with you, is how long does it take for the average person? I don't know what that really means anymore, but for most people to process adrenaline, so you get a hit of adrenaline, you're about to walk yeah, yeah. on stage, uh, your roller coaster moment. Um, somebody says, 
I love you and you didn't realize it. <laughs> you know, like there's no trend. <laughs> that one might take that one might take years. <laughs> <laughs> um, so yeah. acute adrenaline. How long does it yeah. take to process once it's it, online? It, it, you know, I don't have the precise answer for this. The scientist in me wants to like research this for you and and give you a very precise number, but it's at least a couple hours. And so okay, because I this usually is where go the, to ninety minutes. I usually say it takes about forty-five to ninety minutes to clear. You think it's that it sounds about right. I, my 40, guess okay. is in one to two hours, and so that sort of falls within the forty-five to ninety. But like, that's an educated guess, so I could look that up. I think we should both we owe it to each other a little bit because I think it's a, I think this is a good question for, well, it's one has to do with cardiac health or um, yeah, um, heart health. But at the same time, like I just want to frame why I'm interested in that is because, yeah. um. There's this misnomer that once a once you feel butterflies or nervousness or excitement, yeah, yeah, yeah. however you frame the internal activation of, I call it just Your being sympathetic switched nervous on. System, essentially. Yeah, yeah, once the sympathetic switches on, that there's this idea. Well, if I could just breathe and think better, I'll be okay. Y- yeah, but you still got adrenaline coursing, and that's so a yes very and right. Agi- like so, in that, there agitating. are exercises yeah. you can do to bring it down, right? Like there are, but it's still mindsets. in the system. It's yeah, like breathing, self-talk, da, 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 da. All like, of that stuff helps. And so that helps, but yes. that helps you bring it down. So the surge of adrenaline isn't, an, isn't a blip, right? It's a wave. And so as you're riding that wave, if you're doing the thing, you can bring the, you can change the trajectory of it. And so it, it, it comes down slower rather than the long tail where you're like, if you did nothing, right? Like you got this burst, you went on stage, whatever, and you then went to the bar to hang out some more and blah, blah, blah. By the time you get to bed, you haven't done anything to – that slope, that gradient a, is still going. Whereas if you finish your presentation, whatever, right, and, and you know you're still going to go out for dinner, but you take the break to be like, do some deep breathing, center yourself, do the, do the things that activate your parasympathetic nervous system, which is the balance, the rest that brings down the curve – yeah. And then, you know, rest and digest. That's right. Sorry, technical term. Um, so you want to go from fight, fight or flight to rest and digest. And so it, it is this awareness in this, this sort of understanding the effects on your body of different stimuli that I'll bring it back is what wearables are incredibly useful for. Yeah. Okay. I right. like how you brought that back. And I'm going to stay here. So if, as, you, if we go back I, I to like, stay, hey, I want to stay here one more time. I want to stay here one more time. <laughs> I know you do. <laughs> I know. Okay. You, you round us home on wearables and then I'm going to, I'm going to come back one more time to the heart. <laughs> do you want to do your comeback thing? And then, and yeah. then we'll, we'll take it back okay. up. <laughs> All right. Good. All right. So the vigorous activity, 75 yes. minutes over a course yeah, yeah. of a week. I'm really excited about, there's an, emerging research on rehit. So hit is yep. high interval, uh, yeah, yeah. high intensity interval training and rehit yep. is reduced exertion, high intensity interval training. And it, it was first introduced um, by a technology company, which I love. I'll give them a plug right now. It's called okay. Carol, the, the Carol okay. bike. And um, I, 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 I wish I had founder stock on this, which <laughs> <laughs> Don't, I, I just, I love it. Maybe one day, but like, yeah, I yeah. really like what they're doing. So they're finding the benefits of a 45 minute run from a cardiovascular health standpoint that they're, they're finding that they can get it in as short as five to seven minutes. And mm. right. I, I hear the, hmm, that's what I did. And so I'll just describe it to you. It's like uh two minutes walking pace on a bike, 20 yeah. seconds flat out. No, no it's printing. Yeah, flat out. And yeah, it's, yeah. it's like at the right tension. And then mm-hmm. there's another kind of two and a half minute or I, I'm taking about one and a half minute break. Uh, oh, again, walking pace on the bike. Sure, sure, and sure. Then 20 seconds as if a wildebeest was chasing you. And yeah, they yeah. figured out the right mechanism that your, your wheels are spinning, but there's the right resistance where it feels really hard. Like I want to stop after 10 seconds. Yeah. And my, pa- my heart is pounding out of the chest. My wife, you know, first time she watched me, goes, I don't think this is safe. <laughs> like, <laughs> like, it's that type of, you know, intensity. Yeah, yeah. And so and she's super fit. So she's laughing. But um, so like, have you got your arms around some of the rehit um, data or what I just described in some version? Yeah. So I haven't looked into that specifically. What I'll tell you is uh, the broader sort of evidence base. And um, so now we're like deep in the weeds and I'm going to, Hang out here for a little bit longer then. Thank so, you. Yeah. Thank you. 
the, the way this breaks down is as follows. So when you look at the literature between science of exercise and cardiovascular outcomes, there's a couple of ways you connect those dots. One is you just look at a large group of people and say, hey, look, the ones who do more exercise tend to be healthier. That's association, not causation, as any scientist knows. Mm -hmm. And so then you're like, well, let's do some causal stuff and see if we can figure out in smaller studies. So like if you make them work out, look, their cholesterol goes down. And we know cholesterol is associated with bad heart disease. Oh, look, they are less likely to get diabetes or their A1C, which is a diabetes mark, comes on. So therefore, you know, that's, that's, therefore it's a probably directionally correct, right? We haven't yet done the study where you say you take, uh, and we have the technology to do this. We just haven't done it. No one's paid for this yet. Is you take 100,000 people, for half of them, you give them a, you know, get your 75 minutes a week at least of vigorous and 150 minutes a week of moderate. And the other half, you say, live your life. And you see, you know, if heart rate, heart attack rates come down or things like that. We don't have that data. We have enough in the other stuff that between association and smaller studies that we think it's all correct. Then when you look at things like the rehit, they take that a step further and they're like, well, the thing that seems to be the, the, the correlation between exercise and cardiovascular outcomes is cardiovascular fitness. So you look at like mm -hmm. VO2 max, things like that, which is like just how much you can, you can get your body to do. So we'll take that as a proxy. And what's the quickest way we can increase your VO2 max, your cardiovascular fitness? And therefore, we're improving cardiovascular health. And so, yes, theoretically, these kinds of workouts could improve your cardiovascular fitness. And therefore, that small causation could possibly associate with cardiovascular outcomes. But we haven't seen, we obviously haven't done it at that scale to be sure that that's all correct. The risk that, that, these kinds of things as a cardiologist, where I see most people run into trouble is my mantra for most people that I talk to is start low and go slow, right? If you, if you really push yourself, it's one thing if you're an athlete and you're a professional or a semi-professional athlete, you've done this all your life, you understand your body, you know how to push yourself. Most, most people who are sedentary don't. And when they start doing something like this, the risk of injury, the risk of heart attacks actually goes up. So if you look at the exercise and heart attack data, there is a peak of risk of heart attack when you start exercising. It goes up. And the reason mm. it goes up is because people do crazy things. And so when you look at, take out the people who were sedentary before and did the sudden burst of intense activity, that disappears. So that's the risk with these kinds of programs. Like they take a lot of this sort of Causation is likely because of these associations, and they turn into programs, which for the average, relatively healthy person they're selling to is fine. But when you start putting that at population scale, you you run into real risk. Hmm. Okay, so you would suggest start slow, mm -hmm. get build your base, absolutely warm up to the intensity that feels right to you, and then for folks that are unfamiliar with what strain, yes. cardiovascular strain feels like. How would you titrate up? I don't even know if that's a phrase, but yeah, no, that's would... right. So there's something called the Borg scale you may have heard of, right? Like which oh, is like sure. self-perceived exertion. So like yeah. at, check in with your body. Like if this is feels too hard, then stop or slow down. Well, that, but that's so subjective. Meaning, you know, you're talking about rate of perceived exertion, right? Mm -hmm. RPE. Yeah. Yep. It's really it that that's what I mean. It's very subjective. And so that's maybe what we do. Come in. That's where wearables. That's what's okay. So perfect. So like round. you can check your heart rate data. Right. And if you're in, as you were calling it, zone five right. and you're flat out and you're close to your max heart rate, slow down. Right. Like there's a whole company, the Orange Theory Fitness, that does like the orange sort of zone of based on heart rate. So th there's ways to do it where you're in that objectively in that zone that you need to be at. Um, and and I'll, I'll close this out with like part of the reason I'm passionate about this stuff is I was part of. And Google, we relaunched uh, Google Fit a few years ago as part of that team. And they're like, hey, we need to like re revive this app. And so we're going to do a new version. But what I said is you should make it scientific. And so for the first time, we partnered with the World Health Organization and the American Heart Association. The WHO had never partnered with any tech company before. They're very nervous about the whole thing. We got them to partner. And it was great. So people actually appreciated it. We made metrics that mapped to... MVPA that it was called Heart Points and Fitbit, we called them Active Zone Minutes. But you just get 150 a week and we'll do the math and all that stuff for you. 
So it was really a way of like taking this, all this great data that we have, all this great science that we have, it's not perfect, but pretty good. And now we can reach millions of people in a way that makes sense for them, give them metrics that they can use to titrate up and, and get to like the health benefits um, that, you know, from the available science we know exist. So what are wearables doing well and where are they falling short right now? Yeah. So wearables have come a long way since the 10,000 steps, which is where they started. Um, they now track your sleep. Um, I know you're wearing an aura ring, but yeah. of many types, right? Like so watches, rings, et cetera. Um, they can check uh, your, not just your sleep, but also like if you have irregular heart rhythm and your risk for atrial fibrillation, which is a, a heart rhythm disorder that increases your risk of stroke fivefold. Um, that's uh, uh, Apple and Fitbit only. Um, but th there's a whole bunch of applications and the mental health stuff is super exciting, which I can also go into. But wearables have come a long way from just tracking steps to tracking a whole bunch of variables. I think where we're sort of the frontier that we're at now is how to integrate them into the rest of the health system, right? So many clinicians still don't understand what I do with this wearable data. Somebody comes in to, to a cardiologist's office or a primary care doctor's office with a new diagnosis of hypertension. And most people, most doctors and clinicians, that includes nurse practitioners, et cetera, will be like, hey, do some more ex exercise, uh, eat better, like a DASH diet or something like that, which is, stands for dietary approach to stop hypertension. It's just lower in salt, more in fruits and vegetables, things like that. Good luck. I'll see you in six months, right? Mm -hmm. And yet we have these tools where you can be like, you know, um, wearable or Fitbit or whatever, and we'll check in on you. And, and in a month or so, give them just a call. Like, hey, what are, you, what are your step counts? What are your active zone minutes doing? And are you meeting the guidelines? And so we, we're sort of falling short on the entire world is having increasing rates of chronic disease. We have tools, wearables, and not just wearables, but other many digital, even non-digital tools. So we have, you know, the solution. What we're ha having trouble with is integrating those in way and delivering them in scalable ways. Just it, something I'm passionate about, something I work on every day, but it's it's just a huge shortcoming. What is the shortcoming? We're not implementing. We're not scaling. Implement. Yeah, we're not okay. reaching so the people who need it. We're selling the product, but the intervention is not where it needs to be. Is that is that what you're I think, saying? There's a I think we're not. Now? We just we don't. There's not enough people have these tools, and not enough clinicians and the system know how to integrate that with. It's so much easier for somebody to write a prescription for high blood pressure pills. A hundred percent. Yeah. So I, I I see where you're going from the point of contact of a physician or. Um, a licensed professional yeah. that the integration at that level is not rich, and it, I, it's, I see where it's even beyond that, right? Like if you think about okay. it, if you have high blood pressure, and I have to write you a prescription, there's a meth mechanism for me to write it. There's a mechanism for you to fill it. There's a mechanism for you to pay for it, and there's even like pill boxes to make it easy for you to take it home, right? Like every single step of the way has been completely thought through. Whereas for this stuff, they're like, good luck. You know, I love this thought because the, the the switched on physicians will say, okay, let's talk about nutrition or let's talk about your movement or whatever. But then they go, they they many of them will stop because okay. they're out of scope, out of training, and they'll make suggestions to lifestyle, which, okay, that it's good. But I love the track that you're saying it's not on the right mechanism. So much so that in elite sport, you couldn't find a coach, still can't. Um, or or elite athlete that doesn't say the mental part of the game is important. And yeah. yet in the flow of business, I'm sorry, in the flow of sport, it's not, there's not a segment in the day that says mental training right, and right. until, until exactly. the last, like say seven years. Yep. And that's really what I spent a bunch of time trying to, with coach Carol, really mechanizing that mm -hmm. training. And if it's not in the rhythm of day of, of one's day and it's left to extra, I think it's, it's too much to ask. It falls off, and, right? Yeah, it falls off. Like who's got extra time? And no so one has extra time. You have to build it in. You have to make it part of the system. I love that you're saying this. Keep, can you keep going one more layer on what the vision that you're holding for um, companies, what they could do yeah. um, or organizations sure. could do to help increase the quality of their people's lives? I'll give you two examples of projects that um, I've been involved in. And... It sort of gives you the potential of wearables 
and then I can sort of extend it to how this will affect companies and so on. Okay. So one is, uh, I'll, I'll double down on the mental health just because um, you mentioned that example. So wearables now can, uh, particularly Fitbit, can track things like heart rate variability, which is a sign of stress, but also something called um, electrodermal activity, which is essentially the sweatiness of your skin. Uh, anyone who's watched a movie with a lie detector test, that's what that is. And so when you lie, you have the sympathetic fight or flight response and your skin gets sweaty. Now what Fitbit has is a passive sensor that senses 24 seven this mechanism. My PhD thesis was depression after heart disease. And anytime I had to figure out something about depression as a psychologist, you'd appreciate this. I'd have to either ask a question on a questionnaire or interview the person, right? It's like, hey, how are you feeling? Are you depressed? How about now? How about now? And that's like, it, it's very frustrating as a, as a subject trying to like deal with your own mental health issues to then have this ad- added layer of like interrogation. And so having a passive sensor is phenomenal. So how do you use that? What good is that, right? So we partnered with a, a company that works with substance use disorder people. And what they did was they said, if they notice some changes, like a resting heart rate that's high, they'll just pop up a message on the, on the wearable that says, do you want to talk to somebody? Now, it could be somebody like a situation like we're in right now. I'm talking. I'm excited. My heart rate's up. I'm at rest, but my heart rate's up. I say no. Or it could be, I'm sitting here, I'm thinking about using, my heart rate's going up because I'm withdrawing and I'm desperate. And I say, yes. And so then I get the opportunity to talk to somebody in my moment of need. And they, on their end, have counselors, but as opposed to like, hey, we'll talk to this guy on Monday and these guys on Tuesday, they're reaching people at their moment of need, right? It's a phenomenal way of like taking a wearable, a huge mental health need, and connecting those. That's one example. A second one is, Going back to like connecting with the health system. So in the UK, in the pandemic, um, this hospital system was looking to uh, figure out how to connect with patients virtually because they couldn't bring them in for their rehab. So after a heart attack, you do something called cardiac rehab. People come in three times a week, exercise, and gradually increase up. We helped them out, sent them some Fitbits. And what they found was that people loved it. They felt connected to the hospital. The nurses could call them up and say, hey, how are your steps? How are your sleep? this mechanism of building in lifestyle as part of it. And then they started taking their medicines more because they felt cared for. They quit smoking at higher rates. Um, The outcomes from that program were like phenomenally better than what they were doing before, which is in person, which you would think would be better because they actually talk to people one-on-one. And so these kinds of things, right? Like if you imagine that, you can then have that same sort of benefit at a slightly less acuity level with employees or teams where, you know, you can have a, a incentive. First of all, it's just raise awareness for everybody, like insight into what are my sleep patterns like? What are my movement patterns like? And, and start to understand that because those things affect work performance, right? Like if in the end you want somebody to perform well and they've got social jet lag where they're sleeping in on the weekends and um, having a normal sleep pattern uh, through the week, Monday morning is going to suck because they've overslept on Saturday and Sunday and their body's like thinking, I'm going to oversleep again, it's Monday, right? So things like that. Um, if you're an, an airline, like, uh, you know, um, and, and we've done this with truckers, for example, or any kind of shift worker that's working odd hours, things like that, understanding those patterns can be incredibly helpful. But then you can build community. You can create groups of folks that engage with each other, support each other. Like, hey, you know, when I was trying to quit smoking, when I was trying to take more steps, fix my sleep, here's what I did that might work for you. So it's just employees, right? Like building community, building, you know, understanding awareness and insight on their own bodies and performance and health so that they can do better at work, but also have better health for themselves. Okay, so let's do a two part on this. One is, it's very clear that many of us don't know exactly what to do with the data. So yep. we are getting better at as a community of knowing what the yep. data means. So the community, it, it's good. And the, the tech players are doing better with taking data and making it actionable and usable. Yep. Right. And so okay. there's, there's a meeting in the middle that's taking place and there's all types of compromises that need to happen oh, from sure. an organizational standpoint to make something medical grade to, you know, commercial, like there's, yep. So we got we got to just remember it's not it's not exactly pure. We're still at the no. 
the beginning yeah, stages market, of beginning closing. Market. Okay. And that being said, is when I get um, when I get information back, uh, there's two things that I would love for you to talk through. One sure. is what to do, what in what data you're most interested in, and mm -hmm. how you apply it in your life. Part two is um, what do you do with data, and I'll I'll double click on that one for a minute. I just need to say it out loud. So for the first part is just use yourself as an example. What data yeah, yeah, are sure. you most interested in, and what do you yeah, do yeah. with it? Yeah. So um, for for you know we get a we have a lot of data, and, and wearables are wonderful because they give you a lot of this data. Um, to some extent, it depends on what your goals are and what you're where you are at. Right. If you're super athletic and and are already pretty physically fit, then that's going to be less interesting to you than maybe your sleep patterns or your stress and so on. So there's that component of it. So me personally, where I, I, I am very interested in the science of these things. So I focus a lot on physical activity because that has the really great science. And so steps and then moderate vigorous physical activity, as we've discussed, sleep. So we partnered with the American Academy of Sleep Medicine theme here about trying to put science into products. And in two of their main recommendations, we've tried to sort of make front and center, which is uh, duration. So at least uh, seven hours, it depends on the person, but six to eight hours of sleep. And, and that's actually become not just the sleep thing, it's become part of the American Heart Association guidelines too, around heart disease, because we know there's a connection between poor sleep. And so one is duration, the second is consistency. So like trying to avoid the social jet lag, like same time to bed, same time to wake up and things like that. There's a whole bunch of like um, other things you can do around sleep as in, um, try and wind down better and all of those kinds of things. But just generally speaking, those are the two data points that I, so physical activity, sleep. And then on the mental health thing, what I tend to try and recognize are patterns. And so if your sensor that, that does the skin conductance or your heart rate variability are trying to show you that like every Friday at 3 p.m., you get the alert that, hey, you were stressed around this time and maybe there's a meeting there that is always stressful for you, then try and do the deep breathing, the exercises that activate your parasympathetic, your rest and digest nervous system, to try and either before or after or both, to try and like sort of mitigate the mental stress that comes with that context. Um, and so those are in order like my personal set of priorities, but that doesn't have to be yours, right? It depends what you're working on. So like to oversimplify, if you're, it's th what I'm about to ask is more like the Panama Canal than it is any sort of forced rank, meaning the Panama Canal, everything has to work together well for it to work. But, yeah. Um, when you when you're interested in heart health and it comes down to your choices like movement, nutrition, mm -hmm. psychological practices, sleep, like how do you think about organizing priorities there? Yeah. So um as a clinician, it, it tends to be like get people to stop smoking, honestly, is like the one of the big things. So you what get percentage that out of, there. of the US is smoking. It's getting lower, which is great. Um, a lot of the taxes and um, things like indoor smoking bans and stuff have helped. Um, still too many. Like I want to say like 20% of And it depends by age and location. There, there's a whole bunch of variations, but still okay. too many people. And I, uh, so that's one bit. And then okay. physical activity, nutrition, but nutrition is complicated. There's The data is even murkier than physical activity and then sleep and psychological, even though... And then it sort of depends on like, hey, if you're hitting some of those and we sort of re-rank, um, the data for the, the lower the lower ones is just not as robust because we've not studied it as long. It does mean that they're less important. Here's where I start to, how I, how I tend to think yeah, about yeah. it is I need all of them and yes. I'm not smoking. So check the box. Like that's, that's easy. I that's do want to get to yeah. alcohol um, uh, and because I know that there's a risk for heart health there. Mm -hmm. uh, so the way that I think about it is maybe a bit contrarian is that if I've got my right exercise in, I'm eating, you know, uh, organic fish and grilled vegetables yeah. and I've got sleep consistent and uh, high quality sleep and I'm, I'm good there. And I wake up in the morning and the first thing I do is I hit the worry button and then I'm agitated and irritated sure. and I'm intolerant and I've got a pessimistic framework and I feel anxious and agitated and irritated and I'm pessimistic and something goes a bit sideways and I exponentially a bit more agitated and irritated. And yeah. then I'm really drained now by 1130. Sure. Yeah. Okay. And then I choose to eat vegetables and organic grilled fish. 
I think that I'm, I've just become one of the most inefficient humans. It's like I've stockpiled all this great resource building, um, just say resource uh, building, mm -hmm. and then I've just opened up the valve and let it all flow, which is a problem because my psychology is not sound. So sure. I, I know I'm saying this and I am a psychologist, but I can't imagine that you, me, um, because I've lived it, I know this, I've, I've exercised well, eat well, yeah. got my sleep right, and I was still anxious. And it was because my psychology was not dialed in right. Oh, no, for and sure. So, like, I, in, in, yeah. I do want to emphasize that just because I ranked it that way, this is sort of an and, not an or. Yeah. It's, it's not that it's less important, right? Like, I, I, I did a PhD on depression, like, in heart disease because mm -hmm. of that connection. So yeah, it's something that I, I think deeply about, and it, it is important. It's just that when you look at the physical activity literature and you take somebody who's sedentary and get them moving, the impact on heart health is much easier to track than if you take somebody like yourself and you get from anxious to less anxious and that impact on heart health, partly because you're doing all the other stuff so well that mm. your risk has already gone pretty low. Right? Yeah, that's super interesting. So, and again, I can make the contrarian argument as well as like, my psychology is great. I'm eating really well. I'm not moving and not sleeping. Yeah. Okay. Like I, it, it's, you sort of need it all. Like that's yeah. the bottom line. Like, and it's what I kind of love about your podcast and, and about like finding mastery, right? Like it's this, you want to not just function. You want to, you want to master in whatever mm. it is you're trying to master. You need the foundation. You need a good sound body. You need a good sound mind. And then you sort of keep working on. And, and in my mind, mastery doesn't have to be athletic, right? It doesn't have to be CEO of the company. It could be like, hey, I'm working on my marriage. I'm, I want to be more present as a dad and I take care of my kids. Whatever it is that's meaningful to you, right? Like if, if becoming a better father was important, but you kind of have to stick around to so be healthy. Um, you kind of have to be nice to them. So make sure your mental state is, is okay, right? And, and then you sort of keep working on the edges of like, oh, well, I got irritated here or I didn't, you know. It, and so you can take that framework and say like, these are all foundational principles that you need for a, a fulfilled, like wonderful life. And, and we have access to the tools to get there. I love that period, full stop. And then when it comes to the wearables and the tech to support it, I wanted the, the second part of that question was what do yeah. you do with the data? And it, to be more specific, what I mean there is we are incredible instruments. The human brain mm -hmm. and mind yeah. and e internal ecosystem is an, I mean, it is a tuning fork at, you know, it's um, remarkable. It's the most, it's the, yeah, it's like amazing what we can do. It's like beyond words almost at some level. And I feel like we, I want to get your take on this because the wearable movement in some cases is numbing that tuning fork ability, meaning that we're externalizing our sense of being okay to look at data before yeah. we feel oh, sure. and calibrate. You know, So the, yeah. the best practice that I'm doing right now is before you look at your phone, before you look at your watch or whatever it might be, uh, for, first thing in the morning, before you do that is see if you can guess what your numbers <laughs> might be. See sure. if you can get a sense of yeah, like, yeah. what was the quality of my sleep and go super simple, red, yellow, yeah, yeah. green, you know? And so do you have any thoughts about this? Oh, absolutely. So a couple of things there. So one is, have you ever gone for a run and then realized you left your watch at home and feel like that doesn't count? <laughs> because <laughs> <laughs> it's going to throw off my algorithm for the entire year. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah. yes, right? Like, cause we get validation by looking at your streaks by, and we, you know, designers like think of this, hey, this will be fun. Like if we make it a streak, then people want to do it more and, and get them more physically active. So, you know, yes, there is that risk that comes with like, you got to step back and be like, okay, just cause like I didn't track that run, like you need to manually enter it or just know that it happened. And like, it's still good for you. Like, even if it's not in your, in your dashboard. Um, and, and the flip side is, I love what you said about the check-in first or like guess. Mm -hmm. um, there's two components to this. There is the data and there's how you feel. And sometimes the two will align. Like I, I felt like I slept great 
and you look at your thing and it says, you slept great. Amazing. Sometimes they'll disagree. And you should understand yourself. And this is part of this, like understanding yourself well enough to know when to ignore it and when to say, hey, maybe I should dig deeper here, right? Like, I slept great. And then it says, no, you didn't. And you're like, huh. And then it says that every night. And you're like, wait a second. Hey, honey, do I snore? Like, and, and yes, maybe you'll sleep apnea. Like, who knows, right? Like, but you just don't realize it because you're, the flip side is like, the thing tells you like, oh, you're you know, agitated, you're upset or whatever it is. Like, no, man, I'm just, I was having a fun conversation and I'm not agitated. I'm just enjoying myself. And so you can ignore that data. So like sort of, so one is just like not over indexing on it. Two is that self-awareness and, and balancing that. The third is where technology comes in, which is super exciting is, um, you know, we talked earlier about this generative AI and, and what it's able to do. So one of the things we just recently released is where um, the model, the artificial intelligence will mine through all your data. And then we'll say, hey, you know, you're trying to improve your runtime. It was actually your sleep. So like sleep a little bit more and let's try that again in a week. This AI coach, essentially. Um, and we're still at the very beginnings of that, right? And you can imagine applications for everything from the AI coach for running to the AI coach for cardiac rehab to whatever else. And coaching is a wonderful thing. It is so hard to scale. And so, and, and part of it is because there's a human connection, right? Like uh, you feel accountable to a coach. You don't feel accountable to a AI in the same way. And so there's different ways this could scale up. Some of it is all AI. Some of it is like human in the loop where they say, um, not we'll have a, a human, but instead of like you only being able to coach, like I work with a, a personal trainer currently who has like 50 clients. Like what if you could have 500 clients, you know, 5,000 clients? What does that look like? And how can we use AI to take this person's knowledge, your knowledge maybe, and scale that up to not just every uh, footballer in the country, but to everybody in the country? It's, I mean, it, it's an exciting future, right? You know, if we can get some of this basic stuff right, um, and there's some real humanity stuff we got to get right at the time of our recording. Um, you and I are geeking out about this, and there's a war that's just broke out, and you know, oh, there's some, so we've got, you know, you know, we've got some really brutal stuff happening, but, um, Okay, not to make light of that in any way. Um, no, no, no. I mean, it, it's so true. Like, I work so hard, like, to save people in the hospital or, like, you know, you spend decades training so you could do this or, like, mm -hmm. putting out products that, like, help people, like, maybe get a little healthier so over time. You'll, and then, like, it gets blown up overnight. It's just, it's horrifying and, uh, and very maddening. Do you think that there's a wearable that might be able to measure or improve psychological health? We're getting closer, which is where I mentioned the EDA sensor. Um, and so we're starting to understand ways to, it's really what you're getting is signals, physiologic responses from the, the psychology. So I got a panic attack, a nightmare. So I had this huge surge of adrenaline and you saw that on the EDA sensor. That's where we're at currently. Um, there's some really interesting work. So a good friend of mine has, uh, young but had a stroke and, and can't speak. And so I was, I was reading this literature around like where they can understand brain waves and use AI to turn that into speech. And that's super fascinating. Right? And you can imagine a future where that, you know, maybe you don't need it to go all the way from that to speech. Maybe it's just anxiety, depression, things like mm -hmm. that. There's a, another person that I have um, met with recently who's working on a suicide prevention um, algorithm. And I could imagine like, um, you know, the suicidal ideation and thoughts, like if you could find a way to codify that as a signal, wouldn't that be amazing? Like, so they, suffice it to say, there's a ton of work happening in all sorts of wearable, but like really technologies around the mind and mental health and, and this whole interface. And, and the COVID has just turned up the dial on mental health, as, as you well know. Yeah, so sure it's, it, it'll be interesting to see what shakes out. Like there's there's a lot of promise, but I don't want to overhype anything. Yet. That's a good position to be in. Do you see wearables moving to per, the periphery, or do you see them moving into integrated into fabric, or are you seeing them is are you seeing it moving into um, furniture? Yeah, none of the above. I, it's weird, but like over the last decade, we've seen iterations of all of that, right? Like there, people have come out with 
pendants and um, even like things that clip into bras or uh, jackets. Uh, Google had a project with Levi's around a smart jacket. And the form factor of the watch just seems to work. And, and maybe the ring. Uh, and ring has some sizing issues and things. But like there just isn't quite yet a form factor that has replaced the watch and, and has reached widespread adoption. It's not from lack of trying. Um, so, so my guess is I think the wearables are going to stay pretty much as a watch form factor and maybe a ring. I think what we're going to see is better sensors and newer sensors, more AI, and, and essentially comp- compute on wearables, le- leading to more interesting applications. Glasses and earbuds, you're, you're rolling those out? Yeah, so I think definitely earbuds um, are getting smarter, and, and are, we're finding more and more health applications. And then you'll see multimodal, so like earbuds yeah. plus watch tell you something, things like that. Right. Um, Google Glass was a thing a while ago. <laughs> And, and sort of fail spectacularly. Um, Facebook has, has its, uh, yeah, you got to take your, your losses too. Um, mm-hmm. Facebook has, or Meta has, as I think it's with Ray-Ban or as some kind of collaboration where they've had a couple of whacks of this as well. It just, it hasn't taken as a form factor. It might be different with AI where like you now have like more meaningful information as opposed to Again, from a health perspective, I'm not sure that you'd get more out of glasses other than like as a consumer than you would, you know, earbuds or watches or things like that. The ears were interesting. There was some stuff we were playing with a while back, maybe like 10 years ago on some of the, um, you know, using that for heart rate variability, using that mm-hmm. for like a haptic device. Yep. Um, you could buzz, you know, your watch mm-hmm. can buzz a little bit too, but like yep. the hap, we're playing around with how to, um, we're even considering um, some of the, uh, oh gosh, I'm blanking on it now. Um, oh my God. What's it called when you measure your brain activity? EEG. EEG. Yeah. Thank you. That's all right. We were, yeah, we were even using, um, that as one of the kind of ways to be thinking about EEG mm-hmm. data, which, you know, is fun. But, um, I remember early days, Nike, Nike actually used the shoe as a place to be yeah, able yeah. to gather some feedback. So, so you're seeing, you're, you're saying wrist. Um, ring, but ears more yep. than more than glasses. Um, yeah, so they, no I mean, contacts. Google even had a smart contact lens. I was right? going to say, yeah, 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 yeah. They used to have the, that. That kind of faded away. I've seen some mm-hmm. really interesting contacts. Uh, not a head-up display. I'm sure that that's happening, but it was um, it was more simple. It was using um, this was using color, which is an interesting idea <laughs> for. It's not really tech. It was no feedback loop, so. Yeah, yeah. Ignore that actually. <laughs> okay, so um, given all the developments and the advances in wearables, um, you know we've been at this for over a decade now, yeah. and is it working? Are we are we getting yeah. healthier as a society? Well, so as a society, we're not getting healthier, right? And I think if anything, um, we're exporting chronic disease to the rest of the world, and what used to be mostly a problem in Western Europe and America is now, we're seeing it in Sub-Saharan Africa and in India and all sorts of things where there are far fewer resources to combat it. If you look at the sort of where wearables have been well applied, you can see impact. The problem is like the vast majority of people don't have access to those kinds of programs. And the structurally our society is set up to send us down the path of chronic disease, right? I mean, this is way more, it's just sort of like, Structurally, we're really well set up to deliver medicines and pills and vaccines and things like that. So the, it's a much sort of bigger societal question than uh, truly like our wearables moving the needle. So, okay, so double click. What do you mean here that we're exporting our chronic issues? What, what does that mean? Yeah, so, you know, if, um, so I grew up in Zambia, in Southern Africa, I did medical school there. Um, and in my medical, in time, in several years of being clinical in medical school, three years, I saw one person with a heart attack, and it was an immigrant, um, so not a, a, a native Zambian. And now we see, and my friends are still there, and, and they'll see routinely, um, you know, 40, 50, 60 year old uh, Zambians having heart attacks, strokes, um, you know, really bad sort of conditions. And, and a lot of it is because over time, less physical activity, westernization of the diet, you know, things like that, that 
we know these are all risk factors, but then we see it playing out all the way where not only are they risk factors, but you see the increased incidence of disease um, in, in populations pretty much all around the world. Optimist or pessimist? I'm an optimist by nature. By, is that by, tr by training or? No, just is who I am. Have... Like it's just literally, like you sort of almost have to be to come mm -hmm. out of, um, and Zambia is a wonderful place, but like I saw a lot of poverty. I saw a lot of suffering. And so that, I'll frame it this way. For me, what that did was it, it, it gave me this tremendous responsibility, right? Like through the accident of birth, I have been, incredibly fortunate and i've um i'll give you one foundational memory so it's a pathology class we're doing an autopsy and the medical students get to read the notes as the pathologist is cutting it open so i'm reading the notes I'm like the woman came in she had a headache turns out she had meningitis we did a a, a a spinal tap the tap showed meningitis it was confirmed the family was told to go buy some penicillin they couldn't afford it she died mm. Mm. And the pathologist at that moment finishes his autopsy, looks up and says, oh, she was pregnant, unbeknownst to the team. So two lives were lost for a dollar's worth of penicillin. And I, that just shook me. Like, and, and so the, it, it sort of, to my core, like I feel the more people I can help, the more people I can reach, improve their health, improve their well-being. And whether it's, you know, the wearable stuff that we've been talking about, or I used to work in Google search and the products that we launched reach a billion people. I wrote a book about it. But this like obsession with like reaching people at scale and helping them stem from that. Just uh, make sure your book is noted here. It's searching for health, the smart way to find information online and put it to use. Um, yeah, you. we'll make sure. And you've also offered a discount code um, for that. And so for our listeners, and so thank you for that. Well, we'll put the, a, a link in the show notes for that. And so to drive awareness to what your findings are and, and how you're helping folks out here. So do, yeah, when you, you were in that experience, do you remember, do you remember if you felt it or, and, or thought it? Both. Like it's, it's visceral, right? For like you, but for you me? were, you work. Yeah. And do you remember what that, um, emotional experience was for you? Like where you felt it, how you processed it? Yeah, no, I mean, it, it, it's, you know, part of this is, and it wasn't the only one, right? Like, that's a sad thing. Like I had multiple experiences where I would routinely try and help people. And they, for example, would go back to their villages and compounds and, and come back with malaria and diarrhea. Or like, there was somebody who worked for us and, and their kid had malnutrition. And I literally bought them food to help the kid and the kid died anyways and like mm, just mm. these incredible experiences that you know it wasn't a single one but it was like accumulation of like a lifetime of decades of, of experience in zambia seeing all of this incredible poverty and suffering but at the same time like these incredibly resilient people who would still find ways to have joy and and live their lives in spite of the challenges that they face who were the most influential people in your life was it inside your, was it at the dining room table or was it outside? My parents for sure. And, and then, and then my wife has been just an incredible source of like sort of secret to my success as it were. Um, we're childhood sweethearts. So I've known her pretty much all my life and uh, started dating when uh, we're teenagers. And it, it's, she's really been the one to like, she helped me migrate to the U S and like, <laughs> Everything from like telling you what to wear to interviews to like, hey, think about we were at a dinner um, and, and I was trying to spread the word about a nonprofit. I was working at Hopkins and the, the person there was like, you know, you should think about being a White House fellow. I'm like, oh, I don't know. And my wife, like, not just me. She's like, he's interested. Tell us more. <laughs> they were very kind and mentored me and I got in. And but, you know, like little things, big and small like that, like she, her, my family, it, like those are sort of some of the fun and then have amazing mentors um, at Hopkins who sort of paved the way to help me get here uh, as well as folks in Zambia. So it, it's, if you, if you add up all the for, good fortune I've had, right? Like aside from the basic, like I'm not one of the poor folks suffering in Zambia. Like I've also had an incredible amount of support and luck. And that only adds to the like, opportunity but also the responsibility so like every time i have an opportunity like your podcast or anything else 
I take it seriously. I prep for it and I see how I can use it to, um, as it were, advance the cause, reach more people and, and help them. Mm. Of all the questions that we have in life, what are the questions that you think about most often? You know, we have a, a limited time in the world and it's, it's about how you want to use it. Time is your most precious commodity. And, and you have spheres of impact. The most immediate are the people you interact with every day. And so how can I be the best husband, the best father, the best friend and neighbor, right? Coworker, colleague, those kinds of things. And then you have larger spheres of impact. So like, who can I teach? Who, you know, how can I, who can I mentor? And because if I mentor that person, they might mentor somebody else and that has impact. What can I build? Who will do that you think about? Do you think about trying to be your best parent or spouse, or are you trying to be the best? The best version of myself. And when you use that language, the best version of myself, how do you conceptualize that? Um, it's hard, right? Like you sort of know, it's easier to understand your failings than to understand what's the best version of yourself. And so like, you know when you're not being a good dad. And if you can cut down the number of times when you feel like you're not being a good dad, then you're becoming a better version of yourself. But it's Super. hard to say for me it's right now medical, what that, that is looks such a like. medical model, though. That I, I, I hear that and I go, <laughs> "You're a doctor." <laughs> wait, <laughs> Jesus, you know, the, like wait, all the elimination of disease equals health. If I'm less shitty, less disease than I'm right. Like, no, absence of yeah. disease does not equal health. <laughs> yes, <laughs> okay, absence so, of disease does not equal health. No, no, no. So if you, if we were to just kind of open this up for a minute, yeah. Because earnestly, I, I am absolutely aligned that you are working on being your very best. And then you, if, we, if we slice that down to a roll, and let's do, you know, as a dad right now, this is not easy. So I, you had yeah. me there 100%. And I, this is really, I think about this a lot. Mm -hmm. And it does, it does begin to become a little bit of a mind bender trying to put words to this. But the way that I've understood it is like, I need to have, I need to use my imagination. Mm -hmm. And then um, have that imagination have some sensory feeling to it. So it's not just intellectual, right? But yeah, I can yeah. feel it. And those are my two guideposts. What does it look like? And what does it feel like feel when like. I'm at my best? And yeah, then yeah. from there, I start to back in um, practices that will help me be that version of me more sure. often. And then I leave full full permission to be able to say, I, that version can change now. Yeah. <laughs> you know, like, so yeah. when you use your imagination, and there's a felt sense to it. What does that look like for you as a dad and feel like for you as a dad? Yeah, I think for me as a, like the best version of myself is really this wonderful, supportive person who can nurture and also, um, I think of it as like this judo move of like channeling their energy, right? Like tantrum happening, a lot of energy, a lot of emotion misdirected at like some frustration that they can't how can i carefully acknowledge that and turn that into and and sometimes it's with a joke and a smile and it sort of swings the other way and then you know like it's this wonderful warm feeling of like yes i helped i turned this like potentially awful moment into something that was joyous and fun and also showed them a way of coping with adversity with this eh, adversity is a strong word but like when things don't go your way in a way that's graceful, right? Like, so that, that would be my sort of idealized version of that. Are you more of a wise human? Like a, we'll say wise man right now, or are you more of like um, a 10th degree judo black belt that is like, in the, <laughs> it, like are you the Zen master? And, and, and none of the above, I'm muddling through. <laughs> I'm just muddling through my day <laughs> trying through. to get yeah. by. Okay. Oh, that's so good. You asked it's me so to good. imagine, you didn't ask me what day-to-day -day looks like. <laughs> yeah. The actual, right. I, okay, so let's stay there for a minute. Like you, okay. like what you've done is amazing over your body oh, thank work. You. It's, it's amazing. And it's even hard to even track because you've, you wear many hats, you've got thank a you. big motor, um, you're forward thinking in so many ways and you're right on the pulse of what's happening now. Do you, did you ever have a thing of like imposter syndrome? Like they're going to find out 
they're going to know that I'm, I'm going a little faster. I'm a little over my skis, <laughs> you know, yeah. I'm pretending as best as I possibly can. And like, did you ever square with that? Or is, did, did you find different? It's, you know, I've, I've read a lot about the imposter syndrome and it's, it's just, it's different, right? Like, so, um, I think for me, it's taking risks, right? I had a path as a cardiologist, as a Johns Hopkins, and I had to sort of leave that, step away to go into technology at a time when nobody else was doing it. Um, and then sort of prove my worth that that path is worthwhile. And, and that was not a reckless decision that essentially threw away all the investment that people had put in me to become a cardiologist, right? And now I see patients one day a week instead of every day. And instead of being at Johns Hopkins, writing papers on from the mo- one, of, one of the most illustrious institutions in the world, I make consumer technology products at Google. Like it's a, and is that a, is that a sellout? Or is that actually a different way to have impact? And early on, I didn't know, right? I didn't know which way this was going to turn out. And so there was that, um, that again, that sense of like having to prove that this is actually worthwhile, that this is meaningful, that this has impact. Um, and when you're sort of busy doing that work, it's, I didn't have time to stop and think like, am I good enough? It's just like, no, I got it. I got to get this done. Do you have a decision tree or a decision framework that you work from when, you know, it, certainly in these pivotal transitional types of decisions or even in the small ones, like, do you have a, a framework that you use? It's something I've been thinking about. <laughs> um, this was not where I was expecting the interview to go, but I'll, I'll I'll, I'll would would you say that you're uh, unskilled at making decisions? Uh, no, I say no. No, no, no. I think you're I, I'm skilled. sorry. I think I'm, you're just, skilled I'm, I'm just spitballing because I'm like, oh gosh, like this was not what I'd expected. You're but just buying yourself like, another moment. Yeah, no, yeah, it's, yeah. Really, it's really, no, so, uh, because you have a humility, you have a humility, you da, 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 it's like, it's all there. No, you're very sweet. You, yeah. And you've navigated um, complicated environments no, for sure. with precision and fidelity. And so like that, I'm buying you more. No, no, I appreciate anyway. it. I, there's a concept. I've been mulling, it's li- literally I've been processing this for the last few. I, I end up with a lot of giving people career advice, right? People are like, I want to be you, or I want to, I'm thinking about a career that's outside of medicine, that's something crazy. You've done a crazy thing. How does that work out, right? And I, I do those talks at least. I'm flattered that you want to be me. I'm flattered. Yeah, right. Uh, it's, um, but it, it's, it's every. <laughs> Listen, I'm just. <laughs> no, you're fine. Your it's response. Totally is... fine. <laughs> <laughs> right, keep um, that was fun. I do. No, no. Hey, man, dude, if I could like uh, uh No, uh, I know the, what you the, meant. The that Seattle. people walk into your yeah. office and say, yeah, I know. <laughs> wish I could be in Kapil. So, okay. That's right. keep, I'm just um, part of that career advice is this construct of linear and non-linear sort of opportunities. Mm-hmm. Go to medical school, become a doctor. Linear. Right? Go to Google and like reach a billion people or not nonlinear, right? And mm-hmm. how do you go from Dr. at Hopkins to Google? Nonlinear. Like there is just no way to map that clearly. And then the, once you figure out that you're in a linear path or nonlinear, it's different return on investment. So I'll, I'll just try that afresh just so that you have it. So thanks, that's a great question. It's something I think about a lot in terms of decision-making because people ask me, you know, they're about careers and things like that. So in my mind, there's two ways of, of thinking about these kinds of decisions. There's linear and there's nonlinear. So a linear thing is something like you go to medical school, you'll become a doctor. And there the process is relatively straightforward. It's not easy, but it's straightforward. It's like if I take the MCATs, if I study, if I do these courses, pass these exams, I will become a doctor. And, and the, there's a, a pretty straight path to follow. But then there's nonlinear sort of decisions, opportunities, things like that. So for example, in my own life, it was from Google, from being a doctor to going to work for Google. And that path is, it, there is no direct way to say that if I do these things, I will end up as a doctor at Google. And I think it's important to recognize that there are things that can position you for a greater chance of these nonlinear and to be more successful with these nonlinear things. And these nonlinear things have much greater upside. But it takes a certain amount of privilege to be even have access to those and then the courage to take that leap, right? And so 
the privilege is to be in the right circles, talking to the right people, be like, hey, you might be useful here. Maybe we should talk about a job. And then the courage to say, I'm going to leave my cardiology career at Johns Hopkins to go work at Google, right? And so there's a, and not everybody has access or the, you know, ability to make those jumps. But those are some of the ways to think about it. Oh my God, I love those two, linear, nonlinear, and then um, opportunity and risk, you know, yeah. like, or That's opportunity exactly and, and courage. Like, I, I really like that. And um, I think we can practice taking risk. So, mm -hmm. you know, smaller stakes to larger stakes. Yep. And if we don't, if we don't practice it, when the opportunity arises, we tend to overthink and yeah. find all the things that could go wrong as opposed to what could, I, I love what you just did there. Oh, so thank you. thank you for letting me in. And that was yeah. really, that was really good. What the other thing about risk podcast? is, is life oh, rewards sorry. risk uh, differently, depending on mm -hmm. where you are. So if it's someone like you or me, um, I take a risk. I go to Google. If I fall flat on my face, if my product fails and Google fires me and they say, hey, we don't need this stuff anymore. I can go back to being a cardiologist, which is not a bad yeah. backup plan. No, um, yeah, I, understand. I understand. Yeah. Whereas yeah. like if you're a hourly worker at McDonald's, right? Mm -hmm. And you take a risk and like try something different, you might get fired or your car might break down. And like so many bad things would happen that you might end up homeless because there's, you have to follow as many linear paths as you can till you get to a point where you're comfortable enough to take risks. You know, I want to add one more piece to that. My first job, um, I needed to have three jobs growing up. My parents were doing fine, but they weren't handing me anything. Mm -hmm. My first job was at a gas station and um, throwing, throwing newspapers right before that, but at a gas station. And, you know, I, I, I bring that up because it was very clear to me that if I could make, it was like uh, $3.25 an hour, $3.25 yeah, yeah. an hour. And if I could make, uh, $12 over, you know, four hours of work, then I was only going to figure out how to spend six yeah. because I never wanted to be leveraged to make decisions that I couldn't find those linear steps to your point. Right. And so if I would have, if I would have made 12 and spent 15 on credit, then I, I just couldn't figure, I couldn't square that in myself about how to make that work. So I'm not saying I had the right path, but I do know that I had to kind of be really conservative so that I could Correct. lay the risks I wanted to, to lay as opposed to, um, I don't know. Uh, no, no, that's looking, exactly a, right. Right. That, that is exactly the point. Risk. Yeah. No, that is yeah, exactly the point, point, right? Like, so you don't take, you don't take, go spend the extra $3 on a credit card and then end up with a ton of credit card debt. And then you now have to work even harder to pay that off. But the flip side is if you're privileged, you can borrow money to start a business and take that risk. You knowing yeah, right, right. that you have a much greater upside and if it all falls flat you might have assets or friends and family you can call and you won't be homeless right like yeah. so yeah. that you can take non-linear risk from a position of privilege that you just cannot when when you're not in that place did you come from a place of privilege at a young age or like or it's all relative it? so relatively yeah. yes the, the short answer yes. is yes because relative i was to, to zambia to, to, to like Zambia. people who are working on a dollar a day, like for the average American, no, like I had to, you know, really, but I, and I've never had to worry about a meal where I'm getting my next meal in my life or where, you know, in, in between my parents who paid for my education and were wonderful people are wonderful people. My dad passed my mom's away, but, um, yeah. it, it, all of that sort of put me in a position where when I came to the U S I had to be very linear. I'm an immigrant, so I have to do things that, you know, give me a visa. Um, I'm becoming a cardiologist, so I have to do the things that get me to becoming a cardiologist. So I was still taking very linear risks, but I came from a relative position of privilege compared to like most people. Once I was done with my linear risks, that's when I was like able to take the nonlinear risks because I had, I was an American citizen. I'd done enough to establish myself so that I had a good fallback plan, all of that. You're kicking ass. And dude. even then, I had to be careful. I right? Like I would have, I would have started a company when I was uh, ten years ago because I actually wanted to start a wearable company on the Ilium in 2014. But I didn't. I, I, our daughter was just born. And I didn't feel comfortable enough taking that big a risk. Mm. Mm. So even then, my risk was calibrated to to my position. So listen again. You're kicking ass. This is so much fun <laughs> to have this conversation with you. If you were to start, um, 
if you just jump on a soapbox here for a minute and say, look, I know cardiovascular health. I understand this stuff at a deep level related to tech, da, 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 da. Please, if you want to be around in a high quality way for your family, for your yes. purpose in life, start here and do this in a, in, in, in a diligent way every day. Drive that home one more time. Yeah, sure. So if you look up Life Simple 8, that's the American Heart Association had made, has made a checklist of eight things. And, you know, it's the things you would expect. Physical activity, don't smoke, sleep at least eight hours, eat well. And, and you can look at it as like control your blood pressure, cholesterol, and so on. But Life Simple 8, right, is the, is the checklist. And then you can go into sort of more things beyond that. But if you just want purely good cardiovascular health and just good health overall, that's a great starting point. So there's been interesting research around um, heat, so mm -hmm. being in a in a sauna, like a dry sauna in particular, um, are you, uh, uh, you know, big claims around dry saunas right now, 50% all up mortality rate, you know, enhanced or uh, decreased, like, where are you with some of that modalities, some of those modalities? I haven't read the literature, to be honest, so I, I, I honestly can't comment on it. Um, yeah, it's something you just haven't looked at. Where do you take risks for your heart health? Um, I don't, <laughs> I'm not sure. Like, come on, come on, glass um, of wine, two glasses of wine. No, I, I'm not sure. What, like, do I do things that put my heart at risk or do I do things that might give me outsized benefits? I'm not sure what you mean by risk for heart health there. I'm just, I, I'm clearly I, not sure. That's good. What do you yeah. do that uh, you're not optimizing for your heart health? Is it you're sitting too much? You are. Oh, I see. Your sleep has compromised yourself. Is it yeah, glasses yeah. of wine? Sleep. 100 percent. For me, it's sleep. My kids are horrible sleepers. I love them too much to. We never did cry it out. We did wait it out. We're still waiting. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's a tough go. And then um, when it comes, where do you point people to if they go to their internal doc, internal medicine doc, or they go somewhere to have their physical checkup? Or what what test do you point them to? I've used Boston Health. And I've loved it. I think it's um, okay. it's been a solid baseline for me. I'll do one a year. Um, where do you point people to or their physicians to if they're not going to go to a cardiologist? Uh, yeah, yeah. A, um, basic, basic workout. No, I'm, I'm super spoiled. So like when my friends come to me, I send them to my friend who is a preventive cardiologist, who's the preventive cardiologist at Hopkins. So, and then he does a very like, he's got a, he's, he knows way more than I do about this stuff, which is saying a lot. And so he ends up doing things around, you know, CT scans for um, uh, calcium scoring, things like that, or um, very sophisticated cholesterol tests that, that measures. I had one of those, these. I had both of those, like the, the calcium test I had done. Um, one of my friends passed away early. Oh, and uh, so we all of us went, we, we got our, our, our scans done, which is cheap. It's only like, I don't know, it was like a hundred and some dollars out of pocket. Yeah. And I think insurance picks it up as well. And uh, I didn't like what I got back. Um, I'm sorry. And, and yeah. I think it's one of those and things I'm, where... Dude, I'm, I'm, I'm doing my... I'm kicking ass. Like, I'm doing yeah, yeah. pretty... And I didn't like what I got back. It was a score of... It was 94 uh, for calcium score. And I'm like, damn it. <laughs> yeah. so. And it, so I think that brings up two important things. So one is you can do everything right. And, and, and many people do. And it's not a failing to then have this. You know, there's genetics, there's exposures to the in the environment that we just don't know about, right? Like, so it's not a personal failing to have heart disease or diabetes or even, you know, obesity. Like the amount of fat phobia in this country is ridiculous. Like mm -hmm. it is just, um, you know, unhealthy to, to blame the victim. And, and there are some cases like you smoked all your life, you did, it, that's different. But for m many people, you know, there is a huge psychological guilt that comes with that. And, and we should not have, we should assuage that the best we can. So that's one part of it. The other part of it is understanding how to talk with your doctors about, you know, sort of one is many of us go online, we find all this information, calcium scores. I heard it in this podcast. I got to go talk to them about it. What do I do? And, and you have like six or seven minutes, you know, 
we're lucky we might have a concierge doc who will give us more time, but the average person has like a few. And, and the doc has their own agenda, right? Like when I show up, I'm like, okay, I got to go over his meds, make sure blood pressure is okay. And, and they say, hey, I've got to ask you something. Wait, what? Wait, I, no, no, I have my own list first. Um, and, 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 and so, and this is part of what I do in the book is like talk through like, how do you, one, make space in the visit for that conversation? But two, how do you process the recommendations? And so um, I have a good friend um, who sort of is in your shoes, has a high calcium score. I sent it to the expert that I mentioned. And they said, you know, take some statins. And he's like runs the Boston Marathon, like is amazing shape. Like he, he's, he looks great. And, and he's like, but he eats terribly. So he's like, no, 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 I'm going to do this on my own. And so six months, a year, whatever, he goes nuts on his diet. And, and the cardiologist is impressed. Like you've done more with food than you could with just medicines alone, right? So, um, it, in, and I'll get back to the tool in a second. So he goes to vacation and celebrates and then falls, you know, sort of back to his old ways a little bit. Mm-hmm. Goes back in six months and his numbers have crept back up. And so mm-hmm. they sort of do this for, you know, another six month cycle and then gets better and then gets worse. And they finally he ends up on statins and, and now he's on statins and that's kind of what he's decided. And what I try to help him do is like, look, there's a chart that you can make and there's a printout in the book and, and on our website that you can say best case scenario, worst case scenario, right? Like best case is like, uh, I can fix this with heart disease, worst case, with the medicine and without the medicine. And where would you sort of put yourself at? Put an X, because we're all terrible with math. Like we don't understand, you and I maybe, because we have different backgrounds, but many people don't understand probabilities and scores. And, but you can just, if you have a straight line and you say this X is here and this X is here, you sort of can relatively compare. And so you can just see like risk benefit, like with the intervention, statins in this case, and without um, the statins. And, and it became very clear for him that like with the statins, what he could do is have a good life because he would still try on his diet, but he wouldn't have to go all the way to the extreme that he did, which is unsustainable. And so occasionally if he like left, he was okay. But it turned out he also didn't have as much of the side effects because he could do a lower dose. And so like it, he found that like right middle ground on that. But for, for many people, what ends up happening is like you come in, you're like, doc, I know what I need. I need a test. And, you know, it's going to be great because I've been doing all the right things. And doc's like, no, you don't. You need to get your flu shot and maybe your colonoscopy. And that wasn't on the agenda today. And so you end up with this, like, what should be a collaborative process becomes almost confrontational. And so, like, it's, it's a huge waste of energy. And it's sort of like the tantrum and turning that energy, the judo move, right? Like, yeah. either, and, and I tell this to both, like, I tell clinicians, like, if somebody comes in and, and has questions for you and has read up stuff or has a wearable with information, they're interested in their health. They've invested time an effort to do this. You might think it's useless, and it may well be from a clinical perspective. Acknowledge their work and redirect. That's amazing. Now look at Life Simple Eights. It took you like all of 10 seconds to say that, but you acknowledge their work and you send them to where you want them to go. And then you say, I might think you might benefit from a statin, and they'll listen to you. Whereas if you say like, hey, that stuff's nonsense. Let's talk about statins. I'm like, oh, this guy's in the pocket of big pharma. He's just like trying to make some money. So that's sort of like the context there. Yeah, I hope that's I, useful. Yes, it is. And um, I want to say thank you. You know, again, I've, I've loved this conversation. I, I have a better sense of why you've been able to navigate with precision and speed across multiple disciplines. And uh, I just want to again say thank you. I want to encourage people to go grab your book. We'll make sure we've Thank got you. all the, the the show notes in there. And again, if people want to just kind of grab it right now, it's searching for health, a smart way to find information online and just put it to use. And um, again, really appreciate you. Oh, thank you for having me. This was so much fun. And it's, um, I think you do great work. Like I think you're really helping people understand how to live better and that's phenomenal. So thank you for um, having me be part of that. Oh, thank you.